An open world, massively multiplayer online role playing game with complete freedom to do almost anything you can imagine at any time and in first or third person view. Live as an honest civilian, a criminal, a police officer, paramedic, firefighter, or one of several other in depth careers. No levels, no skill grinding, just the actions you perform and knowledge of the role. Player driven gameplay with player driven economy, an enormous persistent world where every aspect is controlled by the players, for the players, gain money, rent property, grow businesses, coming soon to PC. This was the pitch for a Kickstarter game called Identity, all the way back on January 5th, 2015. The project managed to surpass their goal and go on to raise over 10 times the amount of money they claimed to need, all the while delivering almost nothing to the fans. Was this another scam Kickstarter, or did things just not go to plan? This is Kickstarter to court. Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform where anyone can show up, explain their project, their product, their idea, regardless of the viability, stage of development or experience, and see if people will give their money to pursue it. The platform has been the subject of much scrutiny over the years due to not only the prevalence of scams, but also delusional dreamers trying to make it big. No group has experienced these issues quite like the gamers. This is more so true for the MMORPG genre, which is notorious for being the most expensive and time consuming to develop. Despite this being common knowledge, the early years of Kickstarter saw many of them raising millions of dollars, and almost none of them materialized at all. Games like Chronicles of Valyria found their start on Kickstarter, raising over a million dollars before leaving the 30 day funding window, then continuing to take pledges independently to the tune of $8 million. Despite the massive amount of additional funding, there was never a product shipped, even six years later. The same goes for things like Camelot Unchained, with their $4.4 million and no game release after nine years. And of course, the crowning jewel of Kickstarter, Star Citizen, initially raising $2 million in late 2012 and going on to raise $450 million in the 10 years since, without a finished product on the immediate horizon, and this list goes on and on. But back in 2015 when Identity showed up, people were not aware of how these games were going to go, they didn't have this hindsight, they still had hope. And there are pros to backing games on Kickstarter, you are not relying on the big money to give you something new, innovative and fun, instead putting the money in the hands of passionate people, just like you, that might have fresh ideas. It's an alluring concept that saw people more willing to throw money down for what has been described as dream games. Identity is one such game, as an elevator pitch it sounds like what you might have thought games would be a decade into the future, but we never quite got there. It sounds like a game that many people, me included, have always wanted. Think of Grand Theft Auto online mode, but with full persistence in a massive open world with everyone playing their roles and living a second life online. No loading screens, no pay to win, just freedom to do what you want in a world full of other players doing what they want. People were so excited by this prospect that five of them said, I will give you $5,000 each, and you will give me a promise that I will visit the office and spend half the day gaming with a team, though there was no office and the team consisted of only two people, information that was conveniently absent from the Kickstarter funding page. So let's go back to the start. We have an unknown game studio with unknown developers claiming to make a game that would change everything, a familiar concept when looking at Kickstarter in retrospect. The studio behind Identity was created in October of 2014 by a man named John Vandersvet. Three months later, he launched the Kickstarter asking for 150,000 Canadian dollars. When describing the risks and challenges of backing Identity as is mandated by Kickstarter, John claimed to have invested lots of his own money and just needed help to get over the finish line. The implication being the race had begun, they were already running and the finish line was conceivable at this time. Should we meet our goal here on Kickstarter, we'll have everything we need to ensure that identity gets completed. A very bold statement that exists to reassure backers. Your money is safe. If you trust me, I will deliver your dream game. If we get 150,000, you will get identity. And he succeeded. 180,000 Canadian dollars was raised in the 30 day window. It was on. Identity was coming. Retrospectively looking at the Kickstarter page from back then, what many people either missed or didn't pay any attention to was the message that immediately followed John's assurance of delivery. We need you. Identity is going to cost a lot more than 150,000 to produce. Our Kickstarter is a proof of concept to several investors 
and with its success, we'll have the funding we need. Which means you were not buying into a sure thing, you were buying into a proof of concept to lure in the big money. And without that big money, identity could not be delivered in John's own words. Throughout the Kickstarter campaign's history, when it first arrived and then in the months following, John made several references to being in contact with quote, big publishers or groups of investors that would back his vision. For example, in a post on January 6th, 2015, the second day of their fundraise, when John states that they had been approached by some of the largest publishers in the industry, securing their future should it be necessary. This quote would of course lead the public to further assume that identity, and by extension John, was a safe bet. It's only now that we can look back and put the pieces together to see what went wrong. Despite claiming the project was contingent on investors coming in to support the financial side of Asylum Entertainment, John would claim to quote, set aside offers he was receiving so they could maintain complete control of the game's creative direction, or you could say the game's identity. The idea here of course being that while ever the public was still giving him money, he didn't really have to take money from somebody else and give them some of that equity, some of that ownership and some of that say into the product he was making. So that is exactly what they did. They opened up a website where they continued to take in pledges and sold passports to the public that would allow them entry into this fantasy world when it was ready, in less than two years time according to the Kickstarter page, and so as the months ticked by, their budget increased. After the initial raise, things went relatively quiet in terms of major updates. After all, Rome was not built in a day. The only gameplay that had ever been seen by the public was that of the initial Kickstarter trailer, and it only contained a handful of stills from asset packs found online for a few dozen dollars each on the Unreal Engine marketplace, as well as some concept art and a voiceover that explained each aspect of the game and what you would be doing once it was completed. The forums, as well as the other social media hubs during the initial year could be described is a mixed bag. Most people were of course hopeful for the game as this was really a dream come true. Some people were starting to get a little agitated by the lack of progress on display and a small number of people were simply firm in their belief that something was off. The very first post on the identity official forms using the keyword scam came from user QWER28 on March 19th 2016. I don't have concerns I know this is a scam. They make one slideshow video and start this project. Now everything that they are doing are some sketches, many talks, they are programmed absolutely nothing. It's my belief as a content creator that sometimes being early is the same as being wrong. QWER28 was ahead of the curve on his accusations and so his post was met with mockery. This is despite the fact other users were voicing less accusatory but similar sentiments throughout the thread. The major complaints at this time, just over a year post Kickstarter success and an additional $40,000 raised, was that there was zero progress shown. Few, if any, screenshots of anything in-game had been posted, and absolutely no gameplay footage released. There was no evidence that there was a game even being developed. This is especially concerning when looking at it within context. The identity team had claimed closed beta would be available in December of 2016, and it was already March. Closed beta would be quote, mostly complete with bug fixing and polishing remaining, meaning they had less than nine months to put together an entire feature complete game. And if things were going to plan, screenshots and gameplay at this stage should have been very simple to show, especially when your studio relies entirely on public perception to continue operation with the public's funding. The reasons given from John on the identity forums as to why there wasn't any progress being shown was that they were so busy. They wore so many different hats, referring to the different roles each of them had to take on as it was a small business. They simply didn't have time to manage the public relations, posting updates would take away precious time from development, and it wasn't a priority. This is why over the coming months, communication remained mostly surface level. Small teasers were released, whether by word or concept art, they made hints at upcoming milestones such as gameplay footage and trailers, as well as what they called the Town Square module. This would be the first playable experience of identity. They intended to release the game in pieces, to test each as they became available, gather feedback and fix things as they go. The town square would allow players to create a character, explore the small area, access their Kickstarter rewards like apartments which they could then decorate, and meet friends to quote, enjoy a handful of interesting and fun things to do. In October of 2016, John penned an update to talk about their funding situation and the impending town square release which would be coming in early 2017, which was late 
but would bring with it an expansion of their funding in a very, very big way, which would speed up development drastically and bring about a full game release shortly after. In November of 2016, the unthinkable happened. They released a video titled Identity Insider Housing, the first ever look at gameplay since the Kickstarter almost two years prior. This here is an apartment in Ash Hill. Uh, it's still not quite complete. We have a little more work left to do on interface and such, but even as it is, it's the most complete player housing I've ever seen in an MMO. And this is a, a bookshelf is sort of a special container, so it can hold items like other things, but really it only holds books. And what's cool is when you put books in there, they're actually visible right on there. This was it, the proof of concept, the validation of so many people's expectations. The reception was incredibly positive with a like to dislike ratio of 4,000 to 61. The top comment reads simply, finally, great to hear from you guys, which does illustrate that the communication of Asylum Entertainment had to this point been terrible, but people were happy that things were finally finally starting to turn around oh my god this game looks like the best ever created this game looks almost too good to be true i really really can't wait but of course this was not a change in the tide and waiting is exactly what they would be doing waiting for another year for even a glimpse of anything new often we ask the question why would somebody do something in a certain way Ignoring the obvious answer as it's too convenient. With identity at this time, you might have asked, why do they not communicate with the community more often when their funding relies entirely on said community? And the obvious answer was that despite the lack of progress shown, people were still handing over their money and the developers saw no urgency to their current situation. However, something was changing by August 29th of 2017, almost a full year since the housing video released, they started to take communication a little more seriously. This came in the form of the Identity Development Clothing Pipeline, a two hour, 22 minute long video with background music and brief narration while 3 dr assets for the game were created. At this point, you can see what difference one year can make to perception within a community when people have paid money and have been left hanging. Many comments made fun of the boring Nothing Burger video I look forward to the next exciting episode in 2019, watch me paint a wall, then see it dry. Even the positive comments reveal the sentiment of the community to be that of impatience. I know someone reads all of these comments, please take your time on this game, do not listen to the ones who demand a playable client, I've been waiting years for a well developed role playing game, I will wait many more. And honestly it seemed like the wait was starting to pay off as the clothing pipeline video was not the only one to be released at that time. The team spent the next few days doing one to two hour long live streams with different members of Asylum showing what they were working on. And although it was entirely art assets, not actual gameplay, it was still more than the community had seen in years and showed that they were employing people to work on something and that they'd not just ran away with the money and were stringing people along. However, this something turned out to be one of the first real nails in the coffin of identity. On September 21st, 2017, a Twitch livestream took place with the producer of identity and one of the environmental artists. The YouTube video that was subsequently uploaded is titled Identity Development 3D Prop Modeling. In this stream, Lee, the environmental artist, showed the creation of some assets in the application Maya 2016. If you zoom in to the top left of the application window, it says Maya 2016 trial version. Little did anyone in the public know, this landed Asylum Entertainment in hot water. You're not allowed to use a trial version of that software in this commercial fashion, and they had done so on a live stream. This, according to John Vandersvet, when I interviewed him researching this video, led to about $60,000 of legal fees and forced licenses taken from their budget. John claimed this artist was a freelancer and it was the artist's responsibility to have the licenses, a case that they would have won in court, but decided instead to settle the case with an out-of-court agreement due to not having the fees to fight it. Had this been public information at the time, it's likely that funding would have dried up right there and then. With a lack of transparency for the product being created, the lack of meaningful progress being shown, and the incompetence of management actions like this, the writing was on the wall for identity to be a failure to launch. To the backers though, Everything was business as usual, and they were seeing more progress than they'd ever done before, so why not continue? The next major news came on November 3rd, 2017 with a promise of progress. On March 21st, the Town Square module will be live. Not exactly what people were promised with a fully functioning closed beta in December of 2016, but at least this was something, right? 
The moment everyone had been waiting for was almost here. The first time they would get into their dream game that they'd been expecting to play two years prior. At this time, Asylum had raised over $830,000 from almost 20,000 customers and claimed in this update to have rented an office space to house the growing studio. They talked of seeking new recruits, expanding the team, and all the good things to come. It seemed everything was going great, but anyone with a business eye should have been starting to question how any of these finances made sense. $830,000 sounds like a lot but it had been over two and a half years since the initial 200,000 arrived. Even if everyone at the company were taking lower than industry standard salaries, there's no way it would have been prudent to suddenly hire office space at $2,000 a month just in rent, as well as further bloating the salary budget. They were clearly banking on major funding coming in soon, likely with the release of the Town Square module, which they would sell on Steam for around 30 US dollars. On top of this, they were also about to do the unthinkable. February 12th, 2018, Identity, Crime and Punishment Gameplay. And people couldn't believe it. Holy shit, actual gameplay. Glad to see the game progressing. I really hope this game will come out, Lameo. Finally, looks like the hard work and the delayed release paid off as well. But not everybody was happy, and this timeline didn't bring in the big bucks as they were expecting. The trailer showed very little gameplay, especially for three years of development, what they did show was incredibly rudimentary for the year of 2018. Animations were awfully implemented, area of gameplay shown was very small, and the voice acting was was laughable. What are you doing in there? Get a bloody leap face. Get out now. While this isn't a smoking gun, and perhaps people are expecting too much polish from such a small team, it did raise more concerns than it answered. What had they been doing all this time, and where did the money go? The community was in a constant tug of war, with there being three factions. One defended the game, the studio, and John vehemently. The other was convinced they'd all been taken in by an elaborate scam, and the third were somewhere in between. After years of investigating Kickstarter scams and things like that, there's one thing that always holds true. Time will reveal all. The developers were adamant that things were going great, that the game was coming very soon, and it would be everything they claimed. The number of believers had dwindled by this point, but with the first module releasing in just a month's time, they didn't need to believe. They just needed to wait, and all would be revealed. Though they'd be waiting longer than what they thought. The one unfortunate bit of news this developer blog brought was the mention of a date change for module 1. Originally slated for March 21st, the Town Square module is now scheduled for April 23rd release. Despite the social media sentiment, despite concerns for the trailer, despite the delays that repeatedly happened, the finances continued to increase at a rate faster than ever before. They'd raised over a million dollars by this stage, proving that the most powerful element of crowdfunding a game is not delivery, but the emotions that an idea evoke in the potential customers. Identity was late, but it was still a dream game for many people, and if they had to wait, they would wait. If their money could help it come true, money well spent. For all the people that were angry over the delays, the reality is that one month isn't a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, and they'd already been waiting for three years. So what is 30 more days? Except when April 20th, 2018 arrived, just three days prior to the alleged new release date, it brought with it yet another delay. And this time, there were no messages of encouragement. Instead, more accusations that this was a scam. The reason given for the delays were always extremely vague, claiming to just be last minute issues, and this time, there was no new date given. Instead, Paratus, the project lead, claimed very soon, but still, funding continued to grow. I'll not bore you with the next few delays, because what was very soon turned into months. Identity claimed to be releasing in December of 2016 as a full game. What they got was Module 1, a small social hub, on November 30th of 2018, almost four years since the Kickstarter began. I believe it's true that reality never really lives up to the expectation of dreams. It's unreasonable to expect, but identity was no longer a dream, it was a nightmare. Why is it supposed to be this dark? I can't see anything. <laughs> oh, so, I knew this was gonna happen. Okay, this is new. I can hear random people beside me when I'm nowhere near anyone. I guess that's people trying to go to their apartment or something. It's observable in gaming that if a product has a rocky history or the developers make enemies of their community, they're only one good release away from redemption. Make a good product and people will quickly forget what you did wrong. Asylum Entertainment had struggled with public perception for years now, but had one redeeming quality. 
the power of imagination. Imagination got the game funded, imagination carried the game to this point and continued to bring them in money. The second this town square module released, people could no longer imagine the product they paid for, and it was clear that these developers were never capable of delivering it in the first place. This led to crowdfunding completely drying up. Nobody was giving money on the website anymore for pledges as they lost faith in the game completely. The Steam review sat at mostly negative and that was also not bringing in any money. Remembering back to October 21st of 2016 when John said, quote, We've been approached by publishers promising a good chunk of development money. We set them aside so that we can maintain total control over identity. We want to make sure that you get the game you're dreaming of with no compromises put in place by publishers in order to push something out of the door. Had there been interested parties back then, nobody can really say. Between the release of Identity on November 30th, 2018 and the current date, August 2022, there's been almost nothing added to the game in any meaningful way. The only playable experience remains the Town Square module that allows you to create a character with bare bones options and walk around a tiny area, counting how many things still do not work despite being reported as bugs four years earlier. The $1.6 million raised is completely gone, and what remains is 10% of the game they promised. Of that 10%, almost none of it works. That is after seven years of development and raising over 10 times the amount of money they asked for initially. The claim they made was 150,000 Canadian dollars would guarantee this game, but $1.6 million later, and this is what people got. I'm, I'm jumping, I'm crouching. I can't even stand up now. Like I'm in the wall. Oh God, hello inside of face. We can see things like over here, like look, there's concrete. Why is there concrete inside? The hotel, like, please do tell me, like, fix that. Oh yeah, I've shoplifted, and the game crashed. So now you know the timeline of development. Let's dive into some of the information regarding Asylum Entertainment, identity, and the creators. Game development is hard, and they fail all of the time. It's possible to have great intentions, be very honest, and just miss the mark. Money runs out, things don't go to plan, and you just have to move on with life. This happens to big companies all the time. People are adamant that John, the CEO, set out to scam people and walked away with all that money. I'm going to present to you my findings after investigating what I could about all those involved, as well as what John himself had to say when I interviewed him. First, let's address the CEO, the oddity surrounding how he presented himself. John Vandersvet claimed to not only be a veteran programmer and game designer, but also an MMORPG veteran developer, giving him credibility in the field. This is, in my opinion, disingenuously presented at the best, or at worst a lie. John worked for one year doing web development for Curse Incorporated before moving to a small indie development company based in Sweden called Star Vault AB that created Mortal Online the MMORPG. While working for Star Vault for four years and 10 months, John only ever worked on things using Flash, such as a book UI and die system that was then implemented by the other developers. He never at any point had access to the backend code or anything related to the infrastructure of making an MMORPG that would give him any claim to be a veteran in creating games for the genre. The biggest component of making an online game specifically on the scale of an MMO is the networking solution. He didn't ever work on this for Star Vault, so he did not have that experience. His only other position listed on LinkedIn was working for two years, seven months as CEO of a business called Vandernet Incorporated, which I couldn't find any incorporation records for, nor any active products. Immediately after his exit from Star Vault, he started Asylum Entertainment in October of 2014, and within three months made the Kickstarter for Identity. Which means he had no veteran game development or major development experience in his work history, besides making a mod for military sim game Armor, which was called Altis Life, which is a far cry from creating a game from the ground up. That is unless he elected to hide said experience from his LinkedIn profile, his prior employers, as well as from the public, which makes very little sense, as it would build up his credibility, which is clearly what he was trying to do. The Kickstarter, which was the launching point for this entire story, stated almost immediately that despite Identity being a very ambitious project, people could believe in John because the two projects he'd worked on, Mortal and Altis, had solved many of the issues that would arise during development. This is semantically not a lie, because Mortal Online as an MMORPG built in Unreal Engine has solved these problems. It's just that John 
was not the person to work on or solve any of those problems. On top of this, once the Kickstarter was successfully funded, John's first hire for a full-time developer was a man named Henrik Sonesen, who he met while working at Star Vault. Henriksen was let go from Star Vault, as according to a source within the company, quote, he was a junior and we were looking for seniors to move forward with the MMO. Remembering back to the start, it was said that $150,000 was just a proof of concept to show investors. John claimed multiple times that they were in touch with some of the biggest publishers in the world, that they were promised good chunks of money for continued development, and he quote, set them aside so they can maintain total control over identity. The entire Kickstarter premise, the entire promise John made to people for the money raised, was not only that they would take on investment to guarantee the game was finished, but in fact they needed to do so. Which means when he refused to take publisher money, it either never existed and was another lie to project confidence in the project's success, or he sabotaged the entire development, wasting everyone's money producing nothing, while paying himself a salary for four years. It's proven that from day one John knew they needed private investment to get the game made, consistently claimed to have interested parties, and then set them aside for creative freedom, he made the decision to have no game instead of one that made compromises. When I spoke to John privately, he stated he never turned down any offers. Which essentially means that he lied to the public when he said he was setting them aside, because they didn't have offers to set aside in the first place. So either he's lying to me now because of the failures, or he was lying to the public back then, which of course was still at the time giving him money. On June 25th, 2020, well after they'd ran out of money and after things had soured really badly, a newsletter was sent out to accounts following Identity, in which John talked about the road ahead. The game details are not the relevant part of the newsletter as you've seen from this video, the progress from 2018 to 2022 was so small that any promises made were entirely without merit. The pertinent information comes during a section titled Budget and Fundraising. In this section, John described the identity financial situation, stating their annual developer salary budget was about $170,000. What they needed to do was raise more money passively. This is where he introduced Furballs, a mobile game inspired by Rocket League. He claimed that Asylum Entertainment had been tasked with acting as a publisher for the title and quote, while the Asylum team is not contributing to the development of Furballs, we are helping to get their game out to an audience. He also outlines that Furballs is on Kickstarter and if it's funded, will help fund identity. If we are able to do so, Identity will have secured additional funding going forward, you'll be supporting two great games at the same time. In essence, he's emailing the people who paid for a game called Identity five years ago, which they never received, asking them to fund another Kickstarter game. A game that he wasn't even working on, and the idea behind this being, if they don't do it, the likelihood they get Identity is lower, which in and of itself can be described as unsavory, but that isn't the worst part. Doing an open corporate search for John Vandersvet reveals he's the creator and director of both Asylum Entertainment, the developers of Identity, and Phony Games, the developers of Furballs. Which means this newsletter is at best a lie by omission. He speaks about Asylum Games being us and Phony Games being them, but both are him. This again is odd since he leaves the fact he owns the second development studio off of his LinkedIn profile, but when this information went public, John took to the forums to explain himself. He worked on Furballs as a small project in his off time. He claims that no one from Asylum or the identity team ever worked on Furballs, and that he funded the project entirely out of his own pocket. This is a contradiction to the newsletter where he stated no one from Asylum worked on the project as he, the owner of Asylum, was now admitting to have done so, even if just in his spare time, if we are to believe that. There has also been no accounting for the money used, allegedly, for identity development, or how he would have the money on hand to hire dozens of people, separately from identity, that apparently worked on furballs. This also ties into earlier claims he made when stating they were simply too busy to post updates about the game or keep their paying customers informed on the situation, but he did have time to create a second company and develop an entirely new game. The narrative here from people within the community is that John allocated resources away from identity, resources the public gave him for identity. Instead, creating this mobile game with the intention to use a second Kickstarter raise, repeating the cycle of what he'd already done for the last five years. 
Furballs failed the Kickstarter campaign, and the Discord server for the project reveals information about John that backs up the fact he lied about his experience in video game development. As a recall to earlier, when creating online games, the biggest roadblock is the networking. According to John on the 21st of September 2020, quote, there's really just one piece left to develop though. The gameplay itself is there, only the matchmaking slash servers bit left. This was also mentioned eight months earlier in January. Furballs was due to launch into a beta in October of 2020, and as of August 2022, the game is still unreleased. Still, just a couple of weeks of networking development left until the game can launch. John also constantly claims that they have, quote, other projects on the go in an effort to raise money, and that they are looking good so it shouldn't be long, something John has been claiming since March of 2021. They're always just a few months away from securing the funding and finishing each one of these games. The question is, why would John not finish Furballs with all of his networking experience in his spare time if he believed it would be the saviour of identity, when in his own words it was just a couple of weeks from being completed? When I spoke to John about all this, he claimed that big things were still coming and that the reason he does not tell his community about them is because he doesn't want to get them excited just to let them down again. Instead, he's not posted publicly on Discord for over a year and leaves the people who paid for his dream completely in the dark. While it cannot be proven from the outside that John misappropriated his customers' money to create a mobile cash grab game, it is what many believe, and this may not be the only time funds may have been misplaced. The Asylum Entertainment business was registered at a residential property in Ontario, Canada during October of 2014. This property was thoroughly in the middle of nowhere. John owned this house from 2011. However, this is not the only property John used to register his businesses, which allowed me to put together a timeline. John moved to another address about one hour away from his home in August of 2015. He purchased this house with a mortgage, which was then paid off in full one month later according to land ownership records that I acquired. This purchase happened just six months after the Kickstarter cash infusion that John received. Buying a house in and of itself wouldn't raise any red flags usually, but doing so and then paying off a mortgage one month later is extremely odd, especially when John's previous house was then sold two months later for roughly the same amount of money that the Kickstarter raised. Now it's entirely possible this is purely a coincidence and he did not misappropriate any funds, but seeing the timeline, you could make a theory here that John bought the house and paid off the mortgage with the Kickstarter money, then sold his old house to replenish said money. John then sold this house in 2020 and moved to a more expensive house where he currently holds a mortgage. In my conversations with John, he claims to have paid himself almost no salary during the time working at Asylum and that he is in fact over $80,000 in debt on the venture. While I can't say if this is true, it does seem odd that he was able to consistently move up the property ladder into increasingly expensive homes while making a loss on the business, while not paying himself much of a salary, and while also paying to make multiple other projects that didn't take money from any of the identity funds. In my experience of Kickstarter, the more ambitious the idea, the more it tends to ignite the imagination. It's very possible that John is the dastardly scammer that people believe him to be. In my experience, life is very rarely black or white and exists entirely in the grey. It's most likely that John had a dream, he saw the opportunity to give the dream a shot using the low personal risk of crowdfunding, and entirely overestimated his abilities as a developer, and more importantly, as a business owner. In pursuit of that dream, he omitted key information, he embellished his experience, and made some poor decisions. These are characterizations that John disagreed with when we spoke, not seeing the problem in anything outlined in this video. He claims they never had any offers from publishers, despite having many talks, and that he stopped pursuing funding after a while because crowdfunding was just simply going so well. He doesn't believe that what he said about his experience in MMORPG development would give anyone false confidence, and he is still working towards delivering identity, even if it's the last thing he ever does. Regardless of what I believe, I leave it up to you, the audience, to draw your conclusion. At the end of the day, whether he was malevolent, whether he lied, or whether everything was above board, the result is the same. Seven years, $1.6 million, and no game. John was the beneficiary of the MMORPG Kickstarter craze of the early to mid 2010s, and identity turned out much like the rest, existing only in the imaginations of those who dared to dream of their perfect game.